most kids in your situation end up on the street. This is what a social worker told me during a welfare check to my family's home after yet another visit by the police. It was four years ago. I was in high school on a quiet afternoon in Southern California. I was playing video games during spring break, laying back lazily in my chair when suddenly I heard a loud commotion outside. And when I went to the front door, to my horror, I saw several police officers pointing assault rifles at me and my father, who was on the floor with his hands in the air. I froze with shock, fearing death for myself and my father. I watched him get treated as less than human, and at the age of 16, dealt with the aftermath of taking care of my younger sibling and talking to the police. This was not an uncommon occurrence during my adolescence or my youth. Many of the places I grew up in were unsafe. My high school was on national television for what was deemed a racially motivated riot. Teammates on my high school's basketball team regular, regularly called me slurs. Death threats and assault was not an uncommon threat at school. I was stuck between two places I didn't feel safe at. But at the same time, I had ambitions to go to a good college so that I can improve the quality of my life and my family's. I recognized that education was one way out, but I was a first generation low income student at an economically stratified high school. I had to navigate the education system largely on my own. I fought tooth and nail to succeed and to find opportunities at school while I watched my more well-off peers get through school with what seemed like armies of support while I felt like one person fighting the ocean. But I survived and turned my obstacles into stepping stones. I got involved in politics so that I can learn how we can better society for the underprivileged. I became that passionate about mental health awareness after what I witnessed at home, partnering with a national mental health nonprofit to bring more resources to my high school. And these stepping stones have led me here to a top liberal arts college. In many ways, it feels like I've made it, being at a place where I'm given resources and opportunities like never before. And though I've made it to a good college with much better life prospects, I still carry the story with me today. And it's a stark contrast between being here on campus and going home. And for many of the people who know me here on campus, this isn't something I talk about a lot. It's certainly not something that comes up in day-to-day -day conversation. So why am I telling you the story? Well, for one, you all signed up to listen to me talk at you. But more importantly, I tell you all this story because this story and the challenges I faced and overcame are what made me who I am today. These experiences have shaped my identity and how I understand the world. It's hard to sum up these experiences with just a few words, and I shouldn't have to. You see, we're living in a time where diversity and inclusion and attention to people's individual identities are becoming increasingly important. People are becoming more aware of their identities, intersectionality, and how they can build community with people of the same or similar identities. But before I go further, let's take a few steps back. We first need to ask, what is identity? What's included in someone's identity? I mean, it's such an elusive and broad term. And so when I did a quick Google search, I found that Merriam-Webster defines it as the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. And so that's a little obvious. So we need to dig deeper to find a better definition. I found that the American Psychological Association defines it as an individual sense of self defined by characteristics not wholly shared with any other person. And so it's clear that identity includes so much, so much, so many stories, factors, and experiences that make us who we are and shape our worldview. And when we're asked to identify ourselves, we fall back to familiar terms, 
We self-identify all the time, whether we think about it or not. We fill out forms that ask us to check mark boxes about our gender identity, ethnicity, national origin. It's a part of everyday life. And these broad labels have become a primary way that we identify. It's so easy to fall back to saying, I'm Black, I'm Latino, I'm Asian, or, I'm a man, I'm a woman, etc. And these terms are useful to give us a sense of the diversity of a place and hints about the backgrounds of different people. But these large umbrella terms can be reductive if that's the only way that we conceptualize of identity. Let's take Asian American as an identity marker. It's something I'm often identified as and something I even call myself. I mean, it's pretty easy, just look at me, right? But just using the term Asian American presents several issues. First, there are literally billions of Asians across the world spanning several countries and different regions. So someone who's Indian American and someone who's Japanese American could both be considered Asian American, but does that really describe the similarities in their experiences? There's also disparate trends in life outcomes for different sub-ethnic groups. So something that a lot of people um, like to cite is the fact that Asians in America make the most income, and so they're the most successful group. And so they use this to um, support the model minority myth. But this isn't necessarily the whole picture. When we look at sub-ethnic groups within the umbrella term Asian American, we see stark differences in outcomes and life expectancies. For example, the median Burmese household in 2018 made $36,000, while the median in Indian household made over $100,000. There's also differences in college enrollment among young Asians. 48% for Thai people compared to 78% for Chinese people or 66% for Pakistani people. But this isn't to say that all Indian Americans are wealthy or that all Chinese Americans go to college. Within these groups too, there's a heterogeneity that can't be fully indicated by words. For me personally, being, able, being labeled Asian American has put me in a box that makes me feel underrepresented. Being identified as just Asian American doesn't convey how I'm the child of immigrants or the challenges that come with that, how I'm from a single parent household or how I'm low income. In fact, it doesn't even describe how I'm Filipino. A concrete example of how this has harmed me. So I'm a junior in college and I'm graduating next year, don't remind me. And I've been thinking a lot about my career. And so I'll look at diversity programs for different companies that are meant to get underrepresented people into certain jobs. And I would get excited at the prospect of working for a household named company and something I would have never dreamed of as a young child. But upon reading further, I would often find that Asians were not included in these diversity programs, even though I would look at these companies and I wouldn't see anyone with experiences similar to mine, with my background, or have um, similar experiences as me. The broad term Asian American in this situation left me out of opportunities that I would have greatly benefited from. And this isn't to say that identity labels such as Asian American are not useful or meaningful. Lisa Lowe, who's a professor at Yale University, tries to tackle this very question in her work. In what ways are umbrella terms like Asian American useful and how are they reductive? And so in her book, Immigrant Acts, she says that the grouping Asian American is not a natural or static category. It is a socially constructed unity, a situationally specific position assumed for political reasons. And so she acknowledges the usefulness of Asian American for social justice, for political reasons. And we've seen this recently. It's been used in context to combat Asian fetishization, the model minority myth, and most recently, the hashtag stop Asian hate movement. But as she also says, there's a heterogeneity within this term. It's not a natural category. As I said earlier, how much in common do Indian Americans and Japanese Americans have? The differences that Asian Americans have 
often outnumber the similarities that they share. And I know thus far, I've just talked about the term Asian American, but this sort of framework also applies to other identities. So Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a professor at UCLA, is famous for essentially uh, inventing the, con the concept of intersectionality. In her work, Demarginalizing the Intersection, which is again, famous for her idea of intersectionality, and she covers a lot of things. She talks about how the feminist movement can improve if they move away from what she calls a single axis or top-down approach. And what she means by this is the feminist movement focusing on social justice for women specifically. And what she says is that that doesn't necessarily include the needs of women of color or disabled women and so on. And so while Crenshaw's work has a lot of arguments and tells us so much about how we should view social justice, for our purposes, the implication of her argument is that the term woman doesn't capture all the experiences that different women have or the intersectionalities that they have. So tying it all together, coming to college, I got here and I was so excited to find other people who looked like me, shared my experiences, and who I could relate to. And so I, I became and still am very involved in affinity groups and identity-based groups. But sometimes I had this nagging feeling of not fully fitting in. I would go to a space that was meant for Asian American students, and I would often find that I'm the only person who's low income, the only person from a single parent household, and sometimes the only person who is Filipino. And so a space that was meant for me to feel belonging in just wasn't. And I've recently come to terms with this nagging feeling of not fully fitting in. These broad identity labels are just that, they're broad. They're not meant to capture every experience that makes us who we are today. And so when I go to spaces that are meant for a certain part of my identity, they're meant to help me find people who might have my similar stories or relate to that specific part of our identity that we share. But as I've told you all today, there is a blend of factors and identities that make us who we all are. And these spaces based on demographic identity markers are not the end all be all. And so I encourage you all to think, what has happened in your life that's made you who you are today that you can't describe with just a few words? Maybe you're from a rural town without internet, or you had to take care of your younger siblings from a young age, or you traveled around the world growing up. These are all things that inform your worldview now and your identity. So if there's one thing that you take away from my talk, it's this. If you're like me and you feel like there's this part of identity that's really made you who you are, but you just can't describe it in just a few words or can't check mark a few boxes on the census that really captures it, that's okay. Because your unique story makes you, you. Our identities are much deeper than demographic identity labels. If we focus too much on the demographic, we may risk losing the individual. Thank you.